I just like genuinely love these two guys and so I don't get to see them enough. So just having them together in a room, whether it was dinner or whether it was being in the operating room, has is, is been really lovely. One of the great thrills in life is seeing the results of your education in the form of a student and have them become hopefully better than you are. And I really feel that Jordan is that person. He is a better, I'm totally convinced, he's a better surgeon than I was. And I bet he's a better surgeon than he was when he was your resident. He's had a lot of training, a lot of experience, and he's, he's taught himself some things, but he's also had some great education, and he's had a huge experience. And it makes him better. And I want him to be better than me. I, I, that, that's, that's, I'm proud of that. I'm not saying, oh, God, I really screwed up because I wasn't as good as him. No, it's, it, I'm proud of the fact that he is a, a, an outstanding surgeon. And you've had the same experience. Well, you, he's an example from you. He's, I probably, I haven't seen him do a, a, a Lafort three, and I haven't seen him do a craniosynostosis as you did on a regular basis, but I'll bet he does it better than you did. Well, At least I, I hope he did. I do, too. I absolutely do, and and I'm sure that he does. Um, he's he's had additional training that I never had, um, and uh, particularly with the jaw. In well, uh, he had that training with Marshak too, and extensive exactly, craniofacial training. Exactly, and uh, the what I saw yesterday was the implementation of all the basics that I had trained him. And, you know, from the prepping of the incision, the management of the hair, right on through the utilization of the instruments, modifying the bone, you know, it was all just like, and the end result was he was able to do a lot of surgery in a very short amount of time because he knew what came next. And that's, that's one of Jordan's talents, is to be able to choreograph and organize and anticipate um, there was very little conversation with the nurse in the operating room because it's not necessary. And, and that was one of the things that I sort of highlighted in the training. Um, so anything that reduces the amount of time of an operation is to the great benefit of the patient because it's less time to have problems and get sick and have to recover. So shorter is, is better, and uh, I, I was very pleased to see the things that I thought were important that I trained Jordan to do in action and to see the result, which I thought was excellent. Fast in itself is not necessarily a compliment, but fast under control and with the, the help and handing of instruments, in other words, time savers becomes faster surgery, but it's not necessarily fast surgery. That's right. Yeah. It's just like driving on the racetrack. Yep. The guy that's out there making all the noise and smoking the tires is not the fastest guy. Yeah. It's the guy you don't see that's going to win because yeah. he's focused and he's balanced and he's moving things along. And that's exactly what we saw. It's very gratifying. Yeah. It's very gratifying. So to answer the question, I think it's a, a fantastic result of himself and the training he's had and the results he's getting. Absolutely. It's, it's, it's wonderful. And put, put a number on it, Jordan, because I, I can't count that high. What, how many years of training? Uh, probably 16. I mean, it's, it's a lot. You know, I, I did four years of college. You know, I had this, like, uh, I guess it was a com combined, was it six years or five years I did of combo general surgery, plastic surgery. Then I did a... Okay, so there's eight and six is uh, 14. 14. Yeah, and then I did uh, cranial facial. Yeah, you're with you. Right. I did 15. like nine months in Paris and another six in Zurich. Sixteen. Uh, you're with me. Seventeen. I did two years with you. You keep forgetting the second. Well, year. one of you were operating one of them, but we were there together. So there, there you are. Eighteen, nineteen years. Nineteen years. It's yeah. a, it's a lot of training, yeah. and and you know the fellows that I've trained, we have at uh, where's um, you. Well, Jaffers is uh, at uh, the head of uh, Children's Hospital Orange County. He's a, yeah, chief of pediatrics as a craniofacial surgeon at uh, Orange County Hospital. Yeah, you've got Loma Linda. Loma Linda. We have one in Oklahoma City. UVA. We have uh, UVA, um, um, Penn State. And Who's at Penn State? Um, uh, never mind, that's right. Yeah. 
Um, Interesting. Well, so yeah, you got your education all coast, over the country. Coast to coast, Hopkins. Yep. We have one at Hopkins. Yeah. Um, Fantastic. So, there you so are. that's you know that's so that's the lineage that he that's the lineage that he comes from. It's when you can train people and you can place them in institutions of those, of that caliber from coast to coast. It shows what the quality of training that he's had just for my little part. So I trained with uh, Dr. Tessier from 1985 through 1986 in Paris, and I was interested in his work because he was uh, a real pioneer in surgery of the face and skull. And there were very, very specific things that he developed, including access. When you're going to take apart or put back together somebody's face, you have to be able to access the bones underneath because the, the foundation of all the appearance is the bones. So how do you get to the bones in somebody's face? Where do you make the incision so the scar will hide and it will still give you access? This was one of the areas that he was an absolute pioneer. And the second thing that was important was his uh, development of surgical instruments. Now that we know where to make the incision and how to get to all the different bones that hold the face together, what, what instruments do we have that allow us to do that safely and, and properly? And so he was a, a real force in designing and uh, working with instrument companies to develop a specific set of instruments to be able to take the face apart and put it back together again. Um, and the third thing, <clears throat> which was critical and which came later in his life, was the development of imaging. Because if you can't see what you're trying to fix, then how are you going to get it back in the right place? can't see the deformity, how are you going to make a correction? So <clears throat> access, instrumentation, and imaging. So when did you first hear about this crazy guy in Paris doing all this stuff? And then when did you first meet him? So I, f I first heard about this when I was in general surgery, probably in about my fourth year. And uh, one of the other general surgeons had, had read something sort of uh, off scope in the plastic surgery literature about this guy, Paul Tessier, and the amazing things that he did. And what I was hearing from him was so unbelievable that um, I had to track it down and, and find out what that was all about. I was in the process of applying for pla plastic surgery residency in, in Kansas City, and I did get accepted. And once I went there, I discovered that this guy who did all these incredible things, was a regular visit, visitor on an annual basis, and he would come to Kansas City and select his cases and operate. And so <clears throat> it turned out it was serendipity that I was in the right place at the right time with the right guy. Mm -hmm. And I, I spent a couple of weeks every year for four years operating with him, first as first year resident, second year resident, faculty, and then uh, I, uh, second year, <clears throat> had to wait a year um, to get into the fellowship, but just like Doug, I was the guy from the entire world that was picked for that year, same for you, and so I had, the, the slot was already full for the year that I wanted, so I had to work for a year before I could go over there, which was a good thing, because I saved my money and then I could afford a little bit of Paris. So that's, you know, that's how that all started. So let me ask you, the first time as a, as a, a plastic surgery fellow when you uh, scrubbed in with this guy, what were you thinking? Well, I had no idea. I didn't speak French, and uh, he did. And there was a lot of back chatter in French. Um, but he was, he was an extremely forceful person, personality-wise. And also, as a surgeon in the operating room, he, he did not mess around. And what I learned in the first few cases with him was this really brought everything that I was learning together because of all of general surgery, all the physiology and uh, respiratory physiology and cardiac physiology, the stress and strain in the early days, these operations were tremendously long. 
and frequently a lot of blood loss. So a lot of physiologic disruption of the patient in order to reconstruct the face. Mm -hmm. And all of my general surgery training uh, was extremely useful in managing respiration and managing fluid and electrolytes and managing blood transfusions, plus everything that I was learning in plastic surgery about the face and aesthetics and you know the, the various skin operations that were common to plastic surgery at that time. So it was a great coming together. And that's, that's what caused me to go ahead and pursue the fellowship mm -hmm. and to get the full formal training. Like a lot of residents uh, finishing uh, their formal training in plastic surgery, I had planned to spend the following year, which would have been 72, 73, in three locations. Part of it was Australia, part of it was Cape Town, Africa, and the third part was going to be in Zurich, Switzerland. And uh, I'd heard about Tessier, but I, I didn't know much about him. Uh, by a, an accident when I was a chief resident at Stanford, uh, a person asked me if I was coming to the cranial facial meeting in New York City. And so, no, but I went. And uh, the first lecture basically was by the person I was going to spend time with in Zurich, Switzerland. And, it, and I sort of didn't, didn't seem like he was really excited about seeing me. And I thought, what am I going to there, that country for for all this time? And I can't even talk to the guy. Well, the next lecture was Tessier's. And I thought, that's what I want to do. And that was just, it was just so overwhelmingly interesting and incredible what he was doing that there wasn't even a, a second thought. That night, there was a cocktail party at the Palace Hotel. I think it's the name of the hotel. It's across the street from Fifth Avenue. Uh, I mean, from the Central Park on Fifth Avenue. And uh, I kept my eyes on him, and some people sort of got through talking with him. And before he left, I cornered him, introduced myself, and within a minute and a half, two minutes, I got the first fellowship with Tessier ever. And it was, it was just fantastic. And uh, I traveled with Tessier, uh, um, after I came back, we operated in Montreal, we operated in, um, in Chicago, uh, we operated in uh, Philadelphia, and uh, developed a lifelong r friendship with him and, and with almost all of the guys who trained afterwards, like yourself. Right. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, and it, was, it was fantastic. It was, uh, it was an experience. You almost can't believe what an experience it was. You, you sort of hit your hand on the head and say, well, how'd this happen? You know, it, it, it was nothing you planned. It was a why in the road and why you went on that particular bend is, is surprising to you sometimes. I think it's exactly right, and, and I would absolutely agree. As soon as I saw what he could do and how he did it, I was hooked. Yeah. There was no doubt in my mind that this is what I wanted to do, and I had to go there to learn how to do it. Yeah. There was no other place to learn. There was no other place. There, and, were, and there were three or four other people in the world that were doing craniofacial surgery. But didn't, one, they didn't have a training program. They had never trained in doing it themselves. And I think, really, they may have had lots of problems. Tessie had sort of worked <coughs> out the problems. So complications almost didn't exist. Well, one of the, one of the things that I think set Tessie apart, other than his uh, giant intellect, was his insistence on going and visiting and working with as many experts in as many different fields as he could above the shoulders. So he worked with the neurosurgeons, Vizo, and he went with the ophthalmologists, um, and he went with the stomatologists. In France, they don't have oral surgery, they have, or ENT, they have stomatologists, which is the whole, the whole package. And he, he sort of went with the idea of, like with the ophthalmologists, um, what can the eyeball tolerate? What can we do to this eyeball? How far can we move it? How, far can, how hard can we pull on it? How hard can we mash on it without causing permanent damage? And it was that way with all the different structures. And so, you know, Mastardi and, and his eyelid surgery, um, <clears throat> all of those different things were studied intentionally by him. And then he put together an approach to, to you know, access the problem, expose the problem, instrument the problem, make the correction, and put it all back together without causing damage. And, and that was what, that was, I think, pivotal to his success and his, and his uh, preeminence in the world 
was that he made the study. He bothered to learn the basics before he jumped in and started moving faces around. The world of facial feminization just didn't begin by me saying, oh, I think I'd like to do facial feminization. Uh, it, it was probably like, like Tessier, he probably did a Lafort one a long time before he ever did a Lafort two or three. And uh, so I, uh, I was doing craniofacial surgery at the university and I was operating at St. Francis Hospital as my private practice. And there was a doctor there named Ed Falsies who one day and sometime in a lot of, I suppose the fall of 1982, called me and said, I'd like you to feminize this transgender person's forehead. I said, sure. And she came to see me and I realized I didn't have any idea what I needed to do. I didn't know the difference between a boy's skull and a girl's skull. I knew there was a difference. I can tell the difference when I look at a girl and a boy and I can see the difference, but what, what are the, the real differences? And so uh, in San Francisco, the University of the Pacific, which is in Stockton, has a school of dentistry and they have a magnificent skull collection. I don't know how many skulls there, but there are at least 1,500. And so I read five books on physical anthropology to find out what was different. Then I examined these skulls. Now, I was only interested in that time of doing one thing in the forehead. I eventually did the same thing over again for other aspects of facial feminization, but I was just working on the forehead. And I designed four operations that I thought I could do anything I want to anybody's forehead to change it one way or the other, male, feminize or masculinize. I could do anything, but I had these four operations, one, two, three, and four. And those numbers, I think, probably still exist and they work. And so this first patient, I did what I call my two forehead two, and it worked out great. Interestingly enough, she was my first facial feminization patient, and she was also my last, because <laughs> that was my last operation when I retired. She had had a tracheal shave by Ed Falsies some 40 years, 35 years before, and she had a little button on it. She wanted me to remove it, so I took off a little bump on it. <laughs> trachea. So, but it all began by trying to figure out what was the difference between a male skull and a female skull, because I didn't have any idea. And so when Ed Falsies called me and said, I want you to feminize her forehead, I had no idea what I was going to do. Then I called this patient back, Lucy, and we decided what we were going to do, and we did it. And it worked out grand. I love that you said yes first with such confidence, and then you went and figured it out. It's <laughs> absolutely fantastic. I don't know if I told you, you know, she's, uh, she's donated her skull to me. Yeah, I know yeah, that. So uh, someday, someday it'll be here in the office. <laughs> well, I hope not to be here. I, I hope she lives a lot longer. Well, I hope she does, too. I, I told her, I told I her, see that one I told her not to go get in a big hurry or anything. I'm not as young as I once was. And I had decided that I wanted to retire um, close to my 80th birthday. It was August 30th, 2015. And uh, one of the things I feel that is important with facial feminization is that you be a craniofacial surgeon, not just a, a skin surgeon, and maybe not doing just jaw fractures, but really knowing how to contour and move and all the things we learned to do with Tessie on bones. And so I decided to call my colleagues who had craniofacial residency programs around the country. And uh, I don't know where I started, probably out here on the West Coast in UCLA, and I called, I don't know, three, four, five in a day or two. And then uh, about the second day, I called Arlen in Milwaukee, and he said, um, very interesting, he said, uh, somebody's going to call you in about half an hour, 15 minutes or whatever. And in 15 minutes, the phone rang, and it was Jordan. And we uh, talked for a little while, and then we went out for dinner. And he was very interested. So we decided to have him come and watch me do surgery. I don't know how many times, three, four, five. And he really seemed to really like uh, what I was doing. And with that, we decided that he was going to do, go do this uh, to have a, a year's training with me. And then uh, my attorney worked with Jordan's father, who is an attorney, to work out a contract for this, uh, the transfer of, the, of everything. You know, the books, the, uh, the information, the photographs, the whole kit and caboodle. The techniques. And everything. And so uh, that was the beginning of it. And then we worked together basically two years uh, to get this uh, put together. 
But you know, there's a certain compatibility, you know, with certain people. You get along, uh, and then maybe you like their appearance. Maybe you like the way they talk. Maybe the way they like they were trained. Or maybe it's all those things that go together that tells you this is probably a good person. And uh, somebody was interested in doing what I was doing. That was most important. That liked what I was doing, was interested in doing, and wanted to keep doing it. And it went, you know, sometimes there's people that come by and they don't really want to do what you're doing. They sort of sound like they want to do what you're doing, but they don't. And you sort of get that feeling for somehow. And, but I didn't, I got the feeling that everything was very positive with, uh, I found that everything was very positive with uh, Jordan that I liked. And when he, he came to the operating room, I, I suppose uh, his desires to learn, his des he, the, the questions that were asked were all appropriate and things like that. It, it, you, know, you know, it sort of falls together, but if you ask me to say, oh, give me the three things that uh, uh, make you to make a decision, I don't think I can do that. But it was all sort of, every, every blends together, he grows it. And I don't, you as a chairman of a department, uh, I don't, I've been the selection committee of residency at UCSF for years, but I'm not sure that I would want to be in the, making the final decision. And you made that final decision. You never know for sure, but uh, you have a sense that things are right with this individual. He came from a good program, and I, I knew, well, his, I trained his chairman, so Right? Yeah. For, that's right. A, yeah. Well, that's a big plus. That's a big plus. <laughs> I trained his chairman. Tessier trained me. I trained him. And so he has a pedigree th back to Paul Tessier through Doug and I. So it, Doug wasn't a part of the equation at that point, but he, he was an altogether good guy. And he looked a lot like Johnny Depp, so. <laughs> <laughs> so I had the right haircut, as yeah, we yeah. yeah, well, sort of. But one of the things that I also, I didn't mention it when we were talking about with Jordan, was he had all the proper training. I mean, he had his creative facial training with you, and then he went to Paris, and he went to Switzerland. And all those things are extremely important in doing what I was doing in facial feminization. So that was a big plus. Exactly, and, and those, are, those are absolute requirements to have those specialized training. was a intern and assisted me on one craniofacial case at UCSF and then when he started doing facial feminization he put in his literature that he had been trained by Dr. Douglas Ostrout and legally he had been trained but not in not officially, in, in the sense that you and I think would be training with right. me, and he certainly was not trained in facial feminization. So there was a meeting in Boston, oh, that was probably 10 years ago. It was exactly 10 years ago, because it was the day before my father-in-law died. And uh, we were on a panel, and I had the opportunity, and one of his associates was sitting up there, and I said, well, you never trained with me. Uh, you say you claimed you trained under me, but you did one case with me on a cranial synostosis, and that's hardly facial feminization training. And his associate looked like, I mean, they couldn't believe that all this has been going on for years, and he was totally lying about it. Well, there's a lot of that. We're off track for a second, but there was a, a been several doctors over the years that have stood behind us. You, when we're operating with Tessier, you're working with him, you're an assistant, but there's an audience behind you, and they might be for a day, they might be there for two days, they might be there for a week, and they come back to America or wherever and say, oh, I trained with Dr. Tessier. Right. There's a bunch of those. Well, Elizabeth, his scrub nurse for decades, had a, a kind description of those people. What was it? She called them tourists. Tourists. Yeah. So, the, and we, we went through at the end of my training and with one of the manufacturers later to try and, and nail down who exactly really did the full formal training. And the list was quite short. How does one choose their uh, facial feminization uh, surgeon? And that's not an easy one. Uh, one of the things that I was critical about in my book on facial feminization surgery, at the end of each chapter, or most every chapter, I have a question and answer. And one of the things I ask the patient, if you've seen the doctor and he's going to do forehead surgery, has he obtained an x-ray? Has he made certain measurements on you? 
Because if he hasn't taken certain measurements, he doesn't know where he's going to go. If he has an x-ray, he doesn't know what's in front of him. Because if he doesn't know there's a frontal sinus there or how thick the bone is, he may think he's going to contour down four or five millimeters, but the bone may only be a millimeter, two millimeters thick. And now he's got a hole in the bin for it. And how's he going to fix it? And so if they haven't taken the x-ray, your doctor doesn't really know what he's doing. So I'm sort of guiding people to go to the person who does the proper diagnosis, diagnostic, the appropriate diagnostic studies. Because if you haven't done it, how do you know where you're going? And what are you, what are you going to run into? And if, and if you're not a cranial fascia, surgeon, you probably don't even know uh, that 5% of the people don't have a frontal sinus. <laughs> so, you know, they probably think everybody has one. One thing that's come up lately, um, and I've, I've mentioned this to, to some patients from time to time, is that now that every university program uh, is now wanting a gender program, you were even talking about this at your former right. thing. And so, you know, the the chancellor of the of the university goes to the dean of the medical school and says uh, you you need to be doing some gender surgery so they go to the various departments and they say tag you're at plastic surgery chairman uh, you all need to start doing some gender surgery and they go pick whoever in their department who may not even be interested in doing gender surgery at all and say you're going to start a gender surgery program and you're going to do this stuff and the number of revisions is skyrocketing. I mean, it used to be a couple of times a year that here maybe of the maybe 120, 130 cases, maybe 140 of these a year that I do or somewhere in that ballpark, used to be three, four, five of them were a redo. And, and for instance, two weeks ago, I, all three cases were a redo. Mm. The week before that, two out of three of them were a redo. I predicted that. And um, we're starting to see uh, uh, cranial defects. We're starting to see holes that have been burred in the frontal sinus that were not corrected. And so you do need to know how to harvest cranial bone grafts and do craniofacial surgeon type of things. And uh, I, I guess my next question, Arlen, is who's supposed to be doing that sort of surgery? Who's trained to do it? Is it oral surgery? Is it ENT? Is it plastic surgery? Well, I think, I think we know what the answer is, you know, and that's somebody who is specifically craniofacial trained. And it really does not include oral surgeons or uh, ENT surgeons. A perfect example was yesterday in the operating room when Jordan was stabilizing the scalp forward in the advanced position. And he, he uses a, a two little holes through the outer table of the cranial bone and a suture through that tied to the, uh, the membranes of the uh, scalp to hold it forward. And why didn't he put one in the middle? Well. About 10 years ago in San Francisco, one of our plastic surgeons was doing what she learned from me to do a scalp advancement on a woman, and he put a suture in the middle line, and he nailed the sagittal sinus, and she died. Yeah. You don't put a, a hole there because you're liable to have a big-time bleed if, inside the skull. And if you don't have the training and yep. you don't have the experience that you, don't you, know that. That you would get, you would, never, you would never know it, and nope. you would never suspect it. Nope. You would be unprepared. And particularly once you have a hole in the sagittal sinus, there's a very simple thing and important thing that needs to be done uh, that probably uh, contributes to not only loss of blood, but loss of life. Yeah. And uh, they're probably going to die. They're probably going to die unless you know what to do. And if, and if you don't do it, they're going to die. They're going to die. For sure. It's training. It's all about training. I think it was pretty important looking back on it and to this day that I had spent a lot of time in Switzerland learning from these guys that kind of yeah, more or less were responsible for orthognathic surgery. Um, uh, I end up doing a fair amount of orthognathic surgery on some of my transgender patients. I know what to do when I see their malocclusions um, and I also know when to tell them that they probably some people come asking for orthognathic surgery. They've read some misinformation online. They come in, they say, I want this thing, and I know enough to tell them that you don't need it, and you know, uh, you're misinterpreting some things that you read online. Um, so I felt like it's very important. I know uh, where the jaw should live in three dimensions. I know what the chin projection should be. I, I, there's lots of stuff that goes into dental, facial planning that you get during that kind of training. So I thought it was important, but maybe you could speak to it a little bit. Would you be okay with somebody doing feminization surgery that doesn't have that background? You know, I, I'm going to go on. 
I talked about what I did in preparation for doing forehead surgery. And that's all I did on several transgender patients for maybe, I don't remember exactly, three, four years. And then one day, a patient came to me and she said, well, what about my big angle of my jaw and the, you know, I, I've got a square face. And I said, yes, can we fix that? And I said, yes, but I, like with the forehead, I didn't know what I was going to do. So I went back to the skull collection. And I looked at the skulls and realized the difference in the angle of the jaw on a male compared with the female. And I realized I could modify that. So then I approached this patient, and I showed her what I could do, and she was very happy with it. Well, the same thing happened on the chin. And uh, I modified the chin. And I studied the, the x-rays, but the, the x-rays and the, uh, the photographs of the skull clinic. Because I made uh, lots of photographs of these, these skulls, and so I could see the difference between them. I didn't have to go back to the skull collection itself to, to study it, but I could study it without doing that. And it was confirmed in the reading that I did about uh, the anthropological differences between the male and the female skull. And then I went to the upper lip and then on the nose, and it, and it all one was one after another, but it was based on some scientific information. Because one of my feelings, I don't know whether it's true or not, but I doubt if very many people, if any, outside of this immediate group here, have spent much time studying skulls and what the real difference is between the male and female. It's been one of my major disagreements about people doing facial feminization who are coming out of a craniofacial world, or maybe not even a craniofacial world, like this person from uh, San Francisco, and start doing facial feminization without having a, really an idea what their endpoint is. Where they, and I think that's the big thing. I should bring that up. I think one of the most important things in any surgery, but it's very true in facial that you have an endpoint. Where are you going to go? What do you want to obtain? And what, uh, what is the width, the height, the length? You know, uh, and and to, to, to go there for it and have an objective in mind, an operation plan to accomplish that, and to deliver. I think you make an important point. And, and uh, I think it bears a repeating, and that is that through all of this training that we've talked about, through the uh, orthognathic training and the craniofacial training and the plastic surgery training, one of the key elements that's critical and woven through all that training, we talk a lot about structure, but the key is how does that structure impact the shape and the position through the soft tissue? and what kind of soft tissue is there and how, what difference does that make. So it's a very complex thing that all ends up focusing on aesthetics. The whole value of, of being able to do the bone surgery is that's the foundation where all the other shape and soft tissue and animation comes from. And if you're really gonna make a, a legitimate correction, you have to start out with the bone in the correct place. So. Uh, that's how the gender differences originate, is initially from the bone and then what's built on top of that. So by understanding how all those elements fit together, then it guides you on the basis of, of structured formal training to be able to go back and make appropriate adjustments in the bony foundation and then manipulate and overlay the various layers of soft tissue that contribute to the final aesthetic shape. So we haven't stressed enough the aesthetics that's the background of all of this training, the plastic surgery, the craniofacial surgery, and the orthognathic surgery. And they're all critical, and, and they're all discrete, formal, specific training. You, you brought it up perfectly before. You need to have the bone underneath it supporting the soft tissues to do that. And I don't think most people have any appreciation of that. I, I, they might regarding cheeks and putting in implants, and they might regarding the chin a little bit and putting a chin implant in, but to modify it, to make it shorter or to make it narrower, they can't do that. Well, as you, you know, people can always go in with aggressive instrumentation, power tools, whatever, and change things. But one of the things that, that uh, Tessier said, you know, his surgery should never be used for simply moving an abnormal structure into a different location. So it speaks to the idea of really understanding what the shape needs to be, having the goal, being able to achieve that goal, going in a specific direction. I was doing a, a talk or a lecture at, um, at uh, Stanford and I was 
kind of going through all the different pieces and what I do. And at the end, um, they had some visiting surgeons from another country that were there for about three months that were doing some stuff. And they walked up to me and said, you know, these complicated chin T osteotomies that you're doing and all this stuff, they're like, that's, that's so crazy. Why would you do all that stuff? Why don't you just, you know, like we do, we just cut the whole thing off from the back to the front and this makes for a very feminine jaw. And it occurred to me that they didn't fundamentally, and they must not have even been listening that carefully to, to my lecture, or maybe their English wasn't as good as, as maybe it might have been, but uh, uh, they didn't fundamentally understand that the chin is shorter in females than it is, and that you're trying to vertically shrink the face, and that, that can do a lot for the width of the face, what they were describing, but it does absolutely nothing for the vertical size of the face, and that that has to be compressed, and that just kind of goes to the what you were speaking to earlier about understanding the endpoint. How can you embark on a journey and not know where you're going? If you look at the pictures uh, in Vogue, well, maybe it was Vogue magazine, I don't know what it was, with Caitlyn Jenner, you can see that the vertical height of her chin was never approached. It was narrower, and more pointed, but the vertical height is excessive. It's very masculine, and because the doctor didn't have an endpoint there, in right. my mind. And you wouldn't know the difference if you hadn't really made the study. Yeah, exactly. And uh, it really, it really makes a difference to to do those things. I, I really worry about uh, people doing the surgery who have not sort of spent their time studying, studying the difference. And I bet. I don't know this, but I'm willing to bet the majority of them haven't even read a book on physical anthropology, let alone five of them. There's a lot of push on technology in surgery right now, and um, I get asked questions about this all the time because patients have, um, they've maybe seen some other doctors and they've been pitched, uh, well, this doctor uses this particular piece of technology, and, and I'll, I'll call it out in a moment what I'm thinking of. but. You know, virtual surgical planning is one of the things I get asked about a lot. And um, they ask me, and they say, well, do you do this? And I said, I do it sometimes under the right circumstances. And they say, well, this, you know, somebody else has told me that this is the, um, you know, they use this exclusively. They use it on every case that it makes the case safer. And I said, part of the issue is some of this technology is only as good as the person using it. So if you're going to virtually plan a surgery, it's only as good as if they know how to virtually plan the surgery. And, and carry, can carry it out. Right. And then you have to be able to carry it out. So there are those two things. But the other thing that I think is really interesting is whereas for orthognathic surgery, virtual surgical planning has literally changed everything. You used to have to cut casts. There was saw, you know, those plaster dust everywhere. It was really tedious. You can plan these things out very quickly now on a, on a computer screen, 3D print some jigs, and the whole operation is on this one jig. Now with feminization surgery on a, a mandible, for instance, right? You'll go in and you'll contour some, you'll cut off some of the angle, but then you need to be able to look at it and say, is it enough? Yeah. And then you say, no, it needs more. And you go back in and you work a little bit more. And you can't pre-program operations like that because you have to go back in, you have to do some, and then you have to look and see, is it enough? Yeah. You know, I think it's a little bit with even like foreheads on kids, you can't virtually plan out a metopic case because you, you do everything by the jig and then you put the bone back in, but it doesn't look right. You know, it's not advanced enough or the, or the, the lateral orbits are not, you know, projected enough or it's not overcorrected enough. And then you essentially wasted the entire experience of virtually planning it because you have to be able to know what it's going to look like at the end. That's right. And, and so this is where the aesthetic experience and training comes in and the, the ability to look at the final result instead of a computer program and decide is this really what this person needs to look like or is this just a duplication of what the computer thinks they should look like. It's a big difference. It surely is. It's a big difference. One of the things that I liked about Jordan when I met him was the fact that he seemed to have a real interest in aesthetics and he shows it in everything he does, his dress, his office, uh, his possessions. He's got a real high level of aesthetic appreciation. And one of our colleagues, 10, 15 years ago from Texas, took the x-rays of 50 missed Texans, averaged them, and said that was the most beautiful woman. It has nothing to do with the beautiful. It's the appreciation of beauty. And so Jordan has 
an, a, a tremendous aesthetic appreciation. And I really appreciate it right from the very beginning. So I think it's really important that when a patient comes to, to see a doctor about facial feminine, that just like I need to have certain answers, they need to have certain answers. And those answers are, are you trained in craniofacial surgery? Are, what was your training in facial feminization? Because chances are there was no training in facial feminization. Now, do you need to train for everything you do in life? Maybe not, but there's certain things probably you do need to have a little more than just passive knowledge about. If you're gonna do the job that you want to get as a patient. You, it's your body, and you better go to the right person, or you're liable to be back for a second revision. Right. I, or for, I, be back for a revision. I absolutely agree. We saw this years ago in craniofacial surgery. And so many, so many surgeons would uh, go to a weekend course or read a chapter in a book or an article from last month and, and pronounce themselves craniofacial surgeons, and then all sorts of problems were created. Yeah. So the patient, the patient needs to be meticulous about finding, you know, getting the documentation of their surgeon's training. Where did you train? What, how did you train? What do you know? How many cases have you done? How many cases have you done this week? And yes, not how many cases you because, oh, I've done something less than 50. Well, something less than 50 is also one. one. <laughs> uh, it's also zero. It's also zero. <laughs> Yeah, so. one thing is, and I, there's this old adage in surgery, the see one, do one, teach one, and I think that that's totally off. Like, I think it's like oh. see 50, do 100, and then you might be capable of showing somebody else how to do it by that point, but there's an awful lot of pattern recognition. You can't get it from a lecture. You can't get it from attending a meeting and seeing a panel. Um, you can't really get it from just standing over somebody's shoulder and watching them do it two or three times. Um, now. Now, if somebody who did a lot of craniofacial surgery went to watch Paul Tessier do some craniofacial surgery, they might be like, oh, that's a great trick for that particular thing, and then be able to take that and use it, right? Again, but, but absolutely. You, you'd already have to know what you're doing, and then you'd be like, oh, my God, how did I not think of that cool little trick? Then that sort of situation you can learn from seeing, seeing something. But, but you get the basic training beforehand, and you've had probably the operations, done the operations beforehand. Right, you've, you've got to have the foundation to yeah. put that on for, for the trick to even make sense to you. Yeah. So um, there, there's just a lot of preparation and understanding the, not only understanding the statistics, you know, the millimeter difference here and there between the male and the female, but the aesthetics of it. And that's, that's one of the things that Jordan was very good at, uh, was understanding w what's the difference between beauty and ho-hum, and how do you, you know, how do you blend those things together? And we, we see that in his results.